My name is Donovan Brown, and I have DevOps in my title. So it's kind of weird, right? Because 10 years ago, DevOps wasn't even a word. So now we're putting it in our titles. But what does it actually mean? When I got DevOps first put into my title, this is something that I labored over. And my manager asked me, so Donovan, what is DevOps? I'm thinking, why are you asking me? Right? Or I'm sitting here at Microsoft. Like, there has to be someone else in here who has an answer to what is DevOps. Like, no, but we're asking you, what is DevOps? So I didn't blurt out an answer. It actually took me 30 days to actually go back in and actually decide, decide what am I going to say. Oh, now I'm very, very loud. I project very well with or without a microphone. But So I labor for 30 days. And I said, OK, what is DevOps really mean? How many of you remember a little company called Compact Computers? Does anyone remember Compact? Man, this is an old company. Wow, I'm old too. Don't worry, I'm much older than I look. I'm actually 46, so I've been slinging code for over 20 years. And I started back at Compact Computers. And I remember back then, whenever I wanted to deploy software, we didn't do any of this stuff. So why are we doing it now was the question I first answered. Why is it important? And then I set off to actually define it. What I came back to with my manager actually is what we have now published in books, on our websites, everywhere. So it's obviously, I think I did a decent job. But what I thought was interesting is, in my head, I had this vision of what DevOps really is and what DevOps can do for your company. And recently on Twitter, I tweeted this video that I think really encapsulates and sort of just shows you what your company can look like if you implement DevOps. So I tweeted this video, but what I want to do is I want to share this video with you right now. And what we're going to do is kind of help it set the stage for what we're going to talk about. Because we're going to talk about how we do this inside of Microsoft as well. So this video is what your company can look like before and after it implements DevOps. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change the tire. Lou Moore himself changes the tire. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. <laughs> when I saw that video, I was like, that's it. Like, that's what everyone should be striving to do. So I tweeted it, because that is the number one way to get a hold of me. If you want to talk to Donovan Brown or anyone on my team, you just tweet at us, and we will respond to you. So I tweeted this video, and I said, DevOps before and after. The majority of the people got it. But two people said there was no value in the second pit stop at all. And I just could not understand this. So I'm sitting up in my office, and I'm reading these comments. And clearly, I'm having some type of physical reaction, because my wife walks in and says, what's wrong with you? Because I'm clearly mumbling to myself, like, they just don't get it. I don't understand. How do they not see that this is an amazing analogy? Like, I think I'm going to write a blog post. She's like, yeah, yeah, you should write a blog post. So there's a huge blog post that explains why this is a perfect analogy for what DevOps is today. But what we're going to do is we're going to quickly talk about these two gentlemen here. You know, I blurred their faces. I didn't want to embarrass them. But I didn't delete the tweet. So you can still go find out who these two people are if you really want to. <laughs> Funny story, I was in England a year ago, and I was telling this story. And one of the people, when I got to the second person, he kind of jumped in his seat. And I was like, that's weird. But I just ignored him and kept talking. That's that guy right there. I actually <laughs> met him in person. It was pretty cool. So let's talk about these people here. First, it says there's a huge increase in the number of people in the second video than in the first. They didn't really solve any problems. They just threw people at it. Well, I go back to my time at Compaq. When I was writing software there, I, Donovan Brown, as the engineer, when I was done, would walk into a server room. 
with ProLiant servers everywhere. These were production servers. And I, Donovan Brown, would pull out a keyboard, type in my credentials, and it would log me in and say, welcome, Donovan Brown. I could now do whatever I wanted to to that server. Delete registry settings, delete files, copy files, do whatever I want to. I was the poor guy swinging a hammer at a ProLiant server so I got it to do what I wanted it to do. And back then, you had to be quick, though. So what I would do then is I would run out of the room as fast as I could, because if I got out before the IT pro saw me, it was his responsibility. <laughs> they had to keep the lights on. I just had to get my software to work. It was a beautiful job if you were a developer. Get in, beat it with a hammer, and get out. Try that today. Impossible. Chances are you do not have passwords to any of the production servers. You probably don't even know where the production servers are. And you have to deal with the auditors, you have to deal with security, you have to deal with devs and ops and the program managers. There are so many people involved in deploying software today. It literally works on that level. There are more people involved today than there were a decade ago or 20 years ago when I was deploying software. So I thought it was a perfect analogy. There are more people involved. But I didn't see these people as people. To me, they were just interchangeable microservices that we string together to make sure that we can deploy software faster than we ever have before. Continuous integration, continuous delivery, infrastructure as code. That's what I was actually seeing. And you think about it. These two gentlemen here, that's security. They literally just hold the car to make sure it doesn't rock off the jack. You need security in your DevOps pipelines today. Another thing that's crucially important is monitoring everything that you do. If you do not monitor it, how do you know if you've improved it or not? You need to measure it now, make a change, and measure it again. These two gentlemen never move. These two gentlemen are watching a three-second pit stop to see how it can be a two-and-a-half-second pit stop next time. You need to monitor everything that you do in your company and make sure that your investments make sense. How many of you, are you on a DevOps transformation right now? Anyone out there trying to do this stuff? A couple of you, right? So I bet the first time you did it, it didn't go so well. It never does, so don't feel bad. And the first thing that I think of is like, man, I need to figure out a way to roll this back if this doesn't work, right? That's like step number two, figure out how to roll back. So I think that happened here at one point. You see this gentleman back here? He has a jack. At some point, I have to believe that jack failed because this guy has a jack too. See what I'm saying here? This is exactly what happens when you're trying to build a pipeline for the very first time. It doesn't work. And your knee-jerk reaction is, is we got to figure out a way to go back in there and protect ourselves from that. Microservices, I only take the tire off, I only put the tire on. And that's exactly what you're trying to do every day. But with all these extra people, they drastically reduce the amount of time, which is what we want to do as well. Let's talk about not refilling the car. I was always taught you fix what hurts most first. And if I look at this pit stop, refilling the car isn't even what hurts most. If we refilled the car at the same rate we did in this video, in the second video, we'd still be done in half the time, right? Because that's the place where you're supposed to focus. So the way that I see this playing out in my head is they realize that they have to figure out how to change these tires faster. And they get the tire changing down to 10 seconds. Then all of a sudden, the guy with the gas on his shoulder is still sitting there for another 20 seconds. And that's the bottleneck now. You don't go and redo everything. You focus on one thing at a time. And then they realize, man, do we want to trick physics and figure out ways to get more gas in the car faster? Or do we want to just shift left technology and innovation that allows the car to go further on less, make it more aerodynamic, make the engine more efficient, so that we can completely eliminate the need to refill the car at all? So anyone who says you didn't add value because you didn't refill the car is completely missing the point. The point is we did not have to refill the car because of so many things that we did earlier. Same thing that when you start doing unit testing. You go from swinging a hammer to being able to do this. To take the value from the fingertips of your developers and put it into the hands of your users as quickly as you possibly can. Because delivering value is why we're doing all of this. So this I love to share because it kind of puts you into my mind space. This is what I'm thinking about every single day when I'm thinking about DevOps. How do I go from the first video to the second video with every customer we have for Microsoft? So when I wrote this down, it looked like this. DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. The most important word of that definition is value. We are not talking about shipping software. We are talking about shipping value. Why do I focus on value? Because it aligns your entire company on a single goal. Remember, again, I tell you the story back when I was at Compaq. The IT pro's job was to keep the lights on the servers on. My job as a developer was to change that server as much as I possibly could. What's the easiest way to keep a stable server stable? Don't change it. Right? Literally, do not change it, and the lights will stay green. You let Donovan in there, trust me, those lights are going to be red if they're on at all when I'm done. 
right? So you, we are literally incentivized to work against each other. They get the big bonus, they get the big checks, they get the rewards when the lights on the server stay on. I get the big rewards, I get the bonus when I go in there and I change that server as much as I possibly can. Because we are actually taught to work against each other, we're making it very difficult for both of us. But if we were both rewarded, if and only if we delivered value to our end users, we would naturally work together. Which is why I made sure the word software did not appear in the definition. Because when I say software, we immediately swift, shift over to the developers and not the operations and not quality and not program management and not security. We're only worried about changing the zeros and ones and that's a flaw because that's not always gonna deliver value. Black Friday, Cyber Monday, two largest shopping days in the world. Does an e-commerce site have to actually change their software to deliver value? No. They can scale up or scale out their infrastructure and now sustain more simultaneous users, keep their response times down, and sell more retail. So you do not have to change your software to deliver value. So focus on value, get your teams to align together, and they will naturally work together instead of working against each other, which we seem to do a lot today. The hardest part of this is the people. People love doing things that they already are comfortable doing. They don't want to change. I honestly do not want to learn another JavaScript framework. I just don't. I learned Angular, then I had to learn Vue, and now there's React, and now there's going to be another one tomorrow. Matter of fact, there's probably another one right now as I'm saying this, being written, that we're going to have to go off and learn, and I'm tired of it. Right? I just want to keep doing what I've always been doing. And what I've noticed is the more successful the company is that I visit, the harder it is to change the people. If you're already number one, doing it the way that you've been doing it for 20 years, how are you going to convince me that I need to change the way that I'm doing it? It's working, right? My favorite example to use is Walmart. Hold the questions. I'll get to you for you, I promise. My favorite example is Walmart. Walmart, was, I think, was invented in 1964, the largest retailer that has ever existed. Extremely successful company. But they've been doing it the same way since 1964, and almost the same way in many cases. Then there's a little company. Who's heard of Jet.com? Has anyone ever heard of Jet.com? Just a few of you, right? Jet.com is not near as old as Walmart. When I was introduced to Jet.com, they were about a year old. The reason I knew who they were is because a year ago, they were nobody. And all of a sudden, they were worth $3.3 billion 12 months later. How is that possible? Because they were born in the cloud. They thought differently. They were doing agile from the beginning, rubbing DevOps on everything and making it better. That's just the way that they thought. And they scared the crap out of people like Walmart in less than 12 months. So what did Walmart do? Something that only Walmart could do. They opened up their checkbook, and they wrote a check for $3.3 billion, and they bought that company. And Jet.com is now a part of Walmart. If you can't afford to buy all your competition, you have to out-innovate them. I was invited to go talk to Walmart shortly after the acquisition. And I told them, congratulations, that was a smart move. Uh, but do yourself a favor. Oh, yeah, and by the way, I'm a shareholder. Do me a favor. Stop buying our competition and just beat them. Make yourselves more like Jet.com and not Jet.com more like you. Because the next Jet.com is just waiting out there to beat our butts. Right? You've got to start thinking this way. Remember in the first video, you heard those cars just lapping that poor car? Every couple seconds, there's another car just roaring past. That's your competition as you're swinging that hammer instead of doing the things you need to do to out-innovate your competition. DevOps is the way that you do that. Software can be a strategic advantage for you even if you're not a software company because there's not a company on the planet that does not rely on software in some shape or form. Right? So make sure that you use it as an advantage. The process, that's the easy part. Agile, Scrum, Kanban, test-driven development, extreme program, we know how to do it. We know how to produce increments of shippable software. The problem is we didn't know how to ship it. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to talk about how we, inside of Microsoft, use the products that we actually produce to produce the products to ship everything that we do inside of Microsoft. Right? So I'm not going to sell you any of our stuff. I'm literally going to talk to you about how we do it internally at Microsoft. But when we think about DevOps, this is what we believe at Microsoft. We try to do this internally, and we try to enable all of our customers to do the same. So how did we do it? How did we become Agile, the largest software company in the world, who was traditionally doing things waterfall? We had three years between every single release of the software that we were doing in the past, but we try not to do that anymore. The reason why is because of this man. He has come in and completely changed everything. Our culture, our business model, our profits, everything has changed. We're open sourcing more things than we ever have in the past, and I think people are starting to see that we are a different company. I remember the first time I got to hear him speak. We have an internal conference called Ready. It used to be called Tech Ready. It happens twice a year where half the company basically goes and learns about what's coming out new. And he'll keynote it every once in a while. 
And at TR19, I remember he was going to be keynoting, and I sat front row dead center, so excited to see him for the first time. I'd never actually seen him or met him. And at that time, I was a seller. I was selling a product called Team Foundation Server, which is the predecessor of Azure DevOps. So I would fly and I'd help our customers in the central United States, convince them that this is the greatest product you've ever seen, and you should write us big, giant checks, and we're going to come in and give you the software. Under the table, my neck was always shaking, right? Because I was always afraid the customer would say, so how do you use this product internally? Because back then, we weren't. Here we are trying to sell this software to you and convincing you that this software is great, but we don't even use the software ourselves, and we're one of the largest software companies in the world. How horrible is that? And this was when I heard him say, we have to stop living this fake life where we would write software for others that we would not use ourselves. And it was like he spoke directly to me, because as a seller of this product, being able to go in and say, we use this product would be the easiest way in the world for me to sell it not fearing that they would ask me, and then I have to tell them that we actually don't. And what he was saying there was Team Foundation Server now had to be used by the Windows team, by the Office team, by Xbox. If you write software inside of Microsoft, you are now going to use one engineering system. And that engineering system at the time was VSTS, is what we call today Azure DevOps. So he is why the company has changed a great deal. Because we started dog fooding the product we were going to give to you. Guess what that does to the quality of the product? It goes through the roof. If I can't do my job unless the software I write works, that software is going to work. If I can just throw it over the fence to a customer and I use something else internal that's better, that's not OK. Right? So we started dogfooding a lot inside of Microsoft. And the product that I'm going to be talking to you about, and this is a very important slide because every time I say we, I am not talking about Microsoft. I'm talking specifically about the team that builds this product inside Microsoft. OK? Because the Windows team is on this transformation, but at a completely different stage than this team. The Bing team is on this transformation, but at a completely different stage than this team. So when I say we, I don't want you to tweet, wow, I just heard that the Windows team is now doing three-week sprints, because they're not. right? This team is doing three-week sprints, but not everyone inside of Microsoft is doing that. We are all making this transition. So what this team does is it builds our DevOps suite of products, and it's five services, Agile Planning, Pipelines, which is our CI, CD, Repos, which is essentially what GitHub does, um, but this is private versus public, Azure Test Plans, which is for your manual testers, and Artifacts would be like Artifactory or something like that. So the way I like to kind of group this series of services together is it's everything that you need to turn an idea into a working piece of software. Everything, from the work item tracking to the source control, the CI, the CD, the testing, everything you need to turn an idea into a working piece of software, that's what the product actually provides. So when I said it's one engineering system, this is what we're doing today internally at Microsoft. We have 96,000 of our internal engineers already using this. 20,000 of them are just in Windows alone. right? Windows is bigger than most organizations and customers that I visit. Just that one team has 20,000 people on it. It's unbelievable. But we're being able to now produce more than 85,000 deployments per day. We have millions and millions of work items in there, millions and millions of builds going off every single day. Again, the majority of these work items, I think there's 2 million of those are just from Windows alone. right? So the fact that Windows had to start using this meant that every customer we had would be able to use this product as well, because our biggest customer happened to be internal. right? We actually don't know of any customer we'll ever have that'll be bigger than the Windows team. Uh, which is incredible. So dog fooding it really made it important for us. But this is kind of just goes back and says, we're really doing what we say, and we're forcing everyone inside of Microsoft to use the same tool chain. Now, this is the journey. I started back over here. I was recruited by a consulting firm called Notion Solutions back when this was in beta to go off and ship and help implement it. It was so difficult to install back then that you literally had to hire our company to come in and install it for you. right? But when you got it installed, it was pretty good. But getting installed was very difficult. And what we did is we said, OK, this was tough, but we're going to put our heads in the sand, because we have a crystal ball that's going to tell us exactly what the industry is going to look like in 2008. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to ship another product three years later. In the tech industry, we're going to go dark for three years and assume to wake up three years later and just hit the bullseye every single time. Every time we put our heads in the sand, someone like Jira would pop up and just take over the world for work item tracking. And then Jenkins pops up and takes over the world when it comes to continuous integration. And then GitHub pops up and takes over the world when it comes to source control. So every time we put our heads in the sand, we woke back up saying, man, we are completely behind the curve here. Three years is too long. Let's just try two years instead. <laughs> right? Two years will work. Nope. All right, two years is too long. But one year, I know we can do it in one year. If we only disappeared for one year, we'll nail it. Nope. It was miserable. And this was the time that Satya got on stage and said, we're all going to start using this product. 
So then why did we go back to two years? We actually didn't. We started shipping every three months. And we still ship the on-prem product because the Azure DevOps suite I just showed you comes in two flavors. One we host for you in the cloud that's updated every three weeks, and one that we ship to you that is now updated every three months. But we went from shipping every three years. Right? So there's a lot had to happen inside the organization, and that's what we're going to talk about, how the people changed, how the processes changed, how the products that we use had to change for us to be able to move at the speed in which we move today. And it wasn't just tooling, process, and peoples. Even our architecture had to change. And that's something that a lot of people have to realize. When you have legacy software that was built as a monolith in 2005, shipping that every three weeks is really, really hard to do. But as you start to tease it apart into microservices, up, where I think we're up near 30 of them right now, you start to get a little bit more agility in the way that you're able to develop. When you re-architect your microservices such that they can be deployed in any order that you want, and they'll negotiate what API to use at runtime, means you no longer have a dependency on who has to go first. When you start implementing features like feature flags that allow you to not even have to roll back your software should something bad happen, that's how we got to where we are. But I'm saying all that right now so that you don't think I'm going to say, if you get these tools in place, you're going to be able to go from three years to three weeks. We had to re-architect, and we're still re-architecting this very day to make sure that we move at the speed in which we want to move. We are moving at three weeks per sprint. That's not fast enough. That's just where we are today. So I like to share this story with people because we didn't do everything right. We're still learning. We're eight years in now on this particular transformation, and we're still trying to figure out ways that we can go faster. Those two guys that never moved monitoring it, we get seven terabytes of telemetry a day trying to figure out how we can go faster tomorrow. Right? So that's how serious we are about it. So how did we go from here? Back in 2010, we started with sprint number one. We are a scrum shop. Again, the Azure DevOps team is a scrum shop. What was really cool about going to Scrum there is we hired in a whole team of Scrum experts to come in and train everybody, from the leadership down to the engineers. And that's crucially important to be good at Agile. Too often, you'll send one person to go get certified as a Scrum master and then bring them back into an organization that has been waterfall for 20 years and expect that one person who's never done Agile before to come in and change the entire world. Fails every time, right? So what we did is we knew better, and so we hired in all these battle-worn scrum masters to come in and teach us how to do this correctly, push back on people who had never been said no to before, and made sure that we did it right. Now we don't have to do that. We have 50 feature teams all across the world that are really good at doing Agile, and if we hire someone new, we just drop them into a highly functioning Agile team, and they're going to learn through osmosis. We are now actually on sprint, I think if it's 148 or 149 right now. These are three weeks long, we never stop, and we went from shipping you a box to now shipping you an online service every three weeks. And I say we ship it every three weeks, but we actually deploy twice a day. But what we see deployed twice a day are just hot fixes, bug fixes, performance improvements, not new features, right? Every three weeks we drop new features, but twice a day we actually ship, which again is drastically different from every three years. If you're a Scrum or an Agile shop, you should have something called a definition of done, or your DOD. It's very important that your definition of done be very clear, crisp, and transparent. Everyone in your organization should know it. I would not start, if you're brand new with Agile, with a definition of done like this. This is probably, hands down, the most mature definition of done I've ever come across. This is literally saying that you are not done. You cannot say or claim that you're done until we are getting telemetry from the feature that you added as it is running in production. That is huge. Right? Gone are the days of a developer just saying, it's code complete, I'm done, and then I go and grab something else. Right? This has to be running in production, has to be being monitored, and has to be sending us telemetry saying we did or did not verify our actual hypothesis. Now, this is where you'll hopefully end up. Do not feel bad if your definition of done is code complete right now, or is unit tested, or your code coverage has to certain, reach a certain level. As you go through your retrospectives, keep tightening up that definition of done and strive towards something like this, which is basically, I don't know where we take it from here. Uh, this is probably one of the best I've ever seen, but this is what that team lives and dies by. Telemetry is crucially important for us to make sure that we're actually delivering value and not just shipping features. If you don't monitor it, you don't know if you're actually delivering value or not. If you're a scrum shop, you should have something called a product backlog. It is a laundry list of any and everything that you're supposed to do in this particular piece of software. The product owner's job is to make sure that it's in priority order. Is it? We assume it is. We take their word for it that it is, and we go off and we do the first thing and we ship it. And if you're not monitoring, are they right? We think they are, because we have no way to challenge them if they are or aren't, right? 
Or the one that I always love is when the marketing person comes running into my office, says, stop everything that you're doing. I just got back from this conference. We need to do this instead, pivot everything. We know we don't have enough time, so the developers move heaven and earth to make sure that they ship that feature that this marketing person said they needed to make sure they could sell and make us rich. Did it make us rich? Didn't make me rich. But I killed myself trying to turn this into a working piece of software for them. And they're going to keep doing that to me, sprint after sprint, at the last minute, come in and tell me I have to change everything that I'm doing. But what you should do as a developer, the next time that happens, is say, OK, I'm going to do this for you. I'm not going to tell them, but I'm going to put telemetry in that feature that tells me every single time that feature is used. And I'll go ahead and move heaven and earth one more time. I'm going to ship that feature. And when you come into my office next time, I'm going to show you a chart of how little the last time you asked me this is being used or not. I'll be able to challenge my product owner when we see that the feature that we just implemented that was at the top of the list got zero views, got zero access. I'm not saying that we need to put them on the spot, but we need to reevaluate our product backlog because clearly it's not in the right order. We need to do less of that and do more of something else because you clearly don't know what's important to our users because nobody used it. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't important. Maybe your marketing's no good on that particular item. Maybe your navigation's not intuitive. But now you actually have numbers where you can go off and have an experiment change the navigation, put out some promo codes, get some awareness on that feature, and see if the number moves or not. And if it doesn't, that's simply not an important feature, and we need to go do other things. Telemetry is crucially important for everything that you do, so make sure that you start putting it in there. Don't put it everywhere. Know what question you want to answer, and then put in the telemetry that will answer that question. Putting it everywhere, you'll just get lost. All right, so how are our teams structured? I just said that we have a Scrum team. Historically, we would have a program management team, a development team, and a testing team. A lot of companies still have this set up. A lot of companies doing pretty good with it. We weren't doing very good with it. Why? Because we would have our developers throw untested code over the wall to our testers. They would go off and celebrate with having a pizza party because they meet a milestone, or they had code freeze, and everybody's out there eating ice cream and cake. While this team is over there frantically testing as fast as they possibly can, and then eventually this waterfall of technical debt comes back in the form of bugs, and then now we have to go do a bug bash and then ship whatever the date is we were supposed to ship, right? It was not very consistent, wasn't very good. We also had a lot of automation engineers over here. So these weren't all just manual testers. Some of these testers were engineers who wrote automation to test our application for us. We fired up, clicked buttons, verified things that worked the way they were supposed to. And we realized that they took longer and longer and longer to generate those tests, and we didn't understand why. So Buck Hodges, our director of engineering, went and had a chat with them and said, what's taking so long generating this automation? I said, well, the code is really hard to get high levels of code coverage because of the way the code is written. He says, well, you're an engineer. I mean, you're actually writing code to test code. Why aren't you just going in there and fixing it? Well, that's not my job. Right? My job is to write the automation. It's their job to fix the code. So there was this huge disconnect already, just like the ops and the devs. Here we are, our testers and our engineers. They're not working together. So Buck Hodges said, that's enough of that. Because if the developer who wrote the code found it difficult to test the code, they would simply rewrite the code to make it easier to test. It makes perfect sense. But when you have this divide between the two, the tester and the developer, all of a sudden that doesn't happen. So that's it. You are responsible for quality. You are also responsible for engineering. So we actually merged these two together and made an engineering org. You are responsible for quality from day one. This means those unit tests better get written. right? Those automation tests better be easy to write. Because we, at one point, had 27,000 automated UI tests. You know how many times we ran them and they all went green? Zero. So why are we spending all this time maintaining 27,000 UI tests that have never once run and completely gone green? Because the developers aren't even listening to this signal anymore. I check in code and some tests fail. Yeah, the tests failed yesterday. They're going to fail tomorrow. They test fail every day. So I don't know if it's what I just added or something that was already there. I'm not even listening to this noise anymore. And now is a complete waste of time. People need to trust those signals. So we went from having 27,000 automated UI tests when we combined the engineering team, we re-architected our code, and now we have over 86,000 unit tests that we run, get higher levels of code coverage, and we do it in about eight minutes. Right? So we completely transitioned the way that we test by re-architecting our code so that we could move at speeds that we never dreamed possible before. But we had to combine our testing and our engineering. When Satya said the team that writes it is going to use it, basically the Azure DevOps team uses Azure DevOps to build Azure DevOps, we got rid of all of our manual testers too. I do not recommend all companies do that. Unless you use the product in which you produce, you cannot fire your manual testers. 
But when you have your 500 developers every day have to use a product that they produce, they are manually testing that app every single day. And we do something called safe deployment. Safe deployment is where we actually have six different production environments. Each production environment has a larger group of customers on it than the previous. Ring Zero, which is the very first environment in which we deploy to, is where the Azure DevOps team actually works. So every three weeks, the software that we're using wakes up and deploys itself on top of itself while we're using it. And then for 48 hours, the code sits there while the team's in Hyderabad, India, in Raleigh, North Carolina, in Washington here in Redmond, and the team's in San Francisco for 48 hours have to do their job. If we can't survive 48 hours, if that code breaks at any point, we stop, we figure out what's going on, we redeploy a fix, and it never sees our customers. Then what we do after 48 hours and everything is good, we then deploy to the next ring, which is ring one, and ring one has nothing but friendlies in there. We have some our regional directors, our MVPs, people who are friendly to Microsoft, know that they're getting early code, who want to get early code, get it for 24 hours. If they don't report any errors, if we don't have any telemetry issues, we then continue to do this. It takes about 10 days for it to get through all six rings, assuming everything goes great, and then finally all the customers in the world have this new feature. It's called safe deployment. And our engineering team and our ops team work together to make sure that that happens. So our Scrum team is actually made up of a group of all these people here. So we take all these people and we make what we call a feature team. It's just a Scrum team. We have 50 feature teams across all the locations that I just mentioned. So if you look at the five services that I mentioned, all those services have different groups of feature teams. So one team owns the Kanban board. One team owns work item tracking. Actually, five teams own work item tracking. Uh, some five or six teams own source control and things like that. So these teams own features. And they own features vertically, not horizontally. We do not have a database team and a middle tier team and a UI team. To really be good at Agile, you can no longer slice your applications horizontally. You have to slice them vertically so that you can actually show value every single sprint. Because if your customer doesn't know anything about databases, you trying to do three months worth of database design ahead of time and showing them ER diagrams, they have no idea what they're looking at. But if you show them working software after one sprint, they know what that looks like or not. Is it look like I thought in my head? Because what's so funny about Waterfall is that what you hear and what they meant to say are usually drastically different. Right? You write down all the requirements for five or six months, you go off and you code for a year, and then you show them software a year and a half later, and it looks nothing like what they thought it was going to look like. And that's what Agile is here to fix. In three weeks, I'm going to show you what I think I heard. And you're going to be able to tell me in three weeks if I heard it correctly or not. And what's really cool, even if I heard it correctly, what's really cool when they see the software working for the first time is all these new ideas pop into their head. Wow, I didn't realize it was going to look like that. That's a good We could do this, and we could do that. Great, put it on the product backlog. Let's prioritize it. Let's see what we should go and do next. But you got to cut your application vertically, not horizontally. So these feature teams own the UI, they own the app service tier, they own the database schema, they own everything. So they can actually ship their entire feature themselves. They have direct contact to our customers. I'll give you my Twitter handle again. You can literally tweet at me and I will add these individuals to that conversation if I don't know the answer. You can reach right inside of Microsoft and get answers to the questions that you're dying to get answers to. We no longer have a barrier between our customers and our feature teams. Our feature teams all sit together with very, very few exceptions where we might have a program manager who's remote, but we try to reduce that a great deal. There's usually 10 to 12 people in a room like this. We are in Seattle right now. If you were to go to the Redmond campus and go to Building 18, you could find this exact room. There is a room in, this is a room in Building 18. The people are all going to be different because we rotate the people around the room so they're not always looking at the same wall all the time. And they get a like, kind of fresh uh, look at stuff. And I'll tell you another reason why a lot of them change as well. But this room is an entire feature team. It only sits about 12 people. It's not a big Facebook type area because if you've gone to Facebook, it's just like one big floor and there's no walls anywhere. We didn't want that because if you're listening to a conversation with the person next to you that has nothing to do with what you're doing every day, it could be a big distraction. If you're listening to a conversation in here, it pertains to what you do every single day, which is really powerful. Now, what we don't want is for people to be distracted by too many conversations. So outside of this team room are two focus rooms. They have doors on them. They have whiteboards, conferencing software. So if I'm in Raleigh and I need to talk to someone in Hyderabad, I can have that conversation. But if I need to talk to a peer of mine, they are right here in this room. I don't have to find them on Slack. I don't have to schedule a meeting with them. I don't have to hope they're there. I can swivel my chair, have a conversation, and get back to work again. When it's time for a daily stand-up, everyone just stands up. Because we're all in earshot of each other, you answer the three questions, you sit your butt back down, and you get right back to work. It's really amazing the way that it helps us collaborate. 
Another thing that's really interesting is each one of these rooms, we have the teams that are they're autonomous. They can run their three-week sprint the way that they want to run their three-week sprint. We call it aligned autonomy. The alignment is the fact that you better be ready to ship in three weeks. If you want to do paired programming, knock yourself out. You want to practice test-driven development, go for it. We're not going to tell you that you have to or don't have to do one of those things, but in three weeks, you better be ready to ship. And each one of these rooms is kind of interesting, too, because they all have their own culture. You'll notice that this person here seems to be having a drink at his desk. Some rooms do not allow that. They don't want any food in the room at all. Some people are wearing headphones. Some rooms don't allow that either. They're silent like a library, and they want you to be available to talk without having to, hey, tap you on the shoulder and frighten you because you're listening to your music or something. Other rooms, <laughs> other rooms we couldn't take a picture of. Let's put it that way. So the room that I was in, we would never be able to put up here. And it was an awesome room. And I remember the first day I got introduced to the room, I'm walking in, and there's just stuff everywhere on the floor. And I'm like, this is really weird. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of recognizing these items that are on the floor. So I reach down and I pick one of them up. And then I realize it's a Nerf bullet, you know, Nerf guns. I'm like, that's weird. Like, what is a Nerf bullet doing here? And then I look up and I scan everyone's desk. And on their desk are Nerf guns. Some really nice, like, semi-automatic Nerf guns, like, everywhere. I'm like, what's going on? And then what happens is that team, to blow off steam, if someone got frustrated, they would just start firing each other. It looked like war games in there. And trust me, you did not want to be the person without a gun because you were the one getting shot, right? So I had to go out and buy a Nerf gun, right, to make sure that I was safe and protected in that particular room, which is crazy. But it's cool because every room had their own culture, and the teams knew how to work really well together. Now, we don't force the teams to stay together. Every 12 to 18 months, we give all the engineers an opportunity to go pick a different team to work on. This is extremely powering because I remember working on software for three or four years. Eventually, you just do not want to see that code base again. You just don't want to see the same lines of code one more time. It just drives you nuts. So what we do is like, listen, if you've been working on work item tracking for the last 18 months or two years and you want to go work on source control instead, knock yourself out. If you want to go and start working on Git, clone and rebase and all our low-level technology, go for it. You can move from team to team, which is really nice. So what we do is we have what we call a yellow sticky exercise. What the teams do is the 50 feature leads get up and talk about, you want to come work on work item tracking for the next 12 to 18 months because it's awesome, we're going to have so much fun, and we're going to help our customers, blah, blah, blah. And then the engineers get to basically write on the yellow stickies their first, second, and third choices and put them on a whiteboard. And then we go back in and we balance the teams. 80% of the people go back to the team that they were already on. Why? Because they already know the culture, or they've already bought the gun. Right? It's like, <laughs> I already have an investment in this team. I know how it works. I know how it communicates. And I'm comfortable. Luckily for us, though, about 20% of them move. And that 20% adds a ton of value to the way that we write software. Those are experiences now being spread across the entire organization, which is very powerful. But if you move, you actually move. You have to go sit with that team now. It is not just, I changed. It's like you are now physically a part of that team. You will be in that team room. Uh, so it's a really cool experience there, too. The cross-pollination is fantastic. Let's talk about our sprint length. As a certified Scrum Master, I used to go off and help people figure out how long should your sprint be. Do not do a three-week sprint because you heard Microsoft is doing three-week sprints. That's not the right answer. You should evaluate your internal and external dependencies and determine what is the proper sprint length. I wrote software for a stock trading company. Our sprint length was one week, because you can't make a four-week bet in the stock market. right? My stock market looked good last week. I woke up, but today I almost started crying. right? You can't make a bet four weeks in advance. So we had to have a really short sprint length so that we could react to the external dependencies. I also worked for a medical company once. Our stakeholders and product owner was like actually practicing physicians. right? So for them to come to our retrospective, our, our sprint review, they had to stop billing take time out of their daily schedule, come over to our office so they could watch us show software. They're not going to do that every week, right? But we could get them to do it once every four weeks. So that kind of dictated what our sprint length was going to be. I wasn't there when Microsoft for the Azure DevOps team chose three weeks. So I asked Aaron Bjork, who was there, like, so how did you get to three weeks? I know the exercises I go through with customers, but what was the exercise here? And he started chuckling and said, we call it the Goldilocks syndrome. I'm like, what do you mean the Goldilocks syndrome? He says, well, we tried two weeks and it felt too small. We tried four weeks, and it felt too big. And we got the three weeks, it felt just right. Like, really, like, yep, and we've been sprinting there ever since. Because if you do Agile correctly, there's a lot of rituals. There's a lot of ceremony, daily stand-ups, retrospectives, sprint reviews, planning meetings. Sometimes we break those planning meetings into two parts. And in one week, two weeks even, you feel like you're in more meetings than you are actually developing. Four weeks, on the other hand, feels like I can't estimate effectively. 
Because what I can do four weeks from today is going to be drastically different. I don't know week to week is going to change what I could get done four weeks from when you asked me. Right? And a lot of us try to force four-week sprints into a calendar month, and it never fits. Right? So you're constantly trying to struggle this, and three weeks breaks all that. It's enough work to the rituals, and it never forces us to try to think in month-long sprints. Now, you might notice that these are all overlapped. Those darker areas are the automated deployment of Azure DevOps on top of itself while we're still sprinting. So we don't, we don't stop and then deploy and then start sprinting again. We sprint, 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 sprint nonstop. Pluses and minuses is that you get, plus is that you get into a muscle memory, right? You just get into a rhythm, and you start firing on all cylinders. But you got to remember to take time to celebrate. You got to let your people relax. You got to let them unwind and just tell them you've been doing a good job because it feels like it's a death march sometimes. If you don't take time to say, good job, and I, I've actually been in building 18, you walk in there and there's just food and ice cream and cakes everywhere. And it's just time for us to go ahead and just celebrate that we've been doing a good job. So do not forget to celebrate. So let's break this down. This is what it looks like. We finalize our sprint planning in the first two days. We sprint for three weeks. Three weeks from then, we start a deployment. And the deployment goes for approximately 10 days. What we do is we take two of our individuals on the team and we make them our, what we call our shield team or our SWAT team. Their capacity is taken out and they babysit that deployment for the next 10 days. What you don't do is task your entire team, every individual, to their highest hilt and then still be trying to fix production issues. That's unplanned work that you cannot plan for and you don't know how much it is, so you need people that have capacity to go fix those problems for you and we designate those as the deployment is going out. We all merge out of master. So we have 500 developers, 50 feature teams, 10 to 12 people, merging into master every single day. We have no long-lived branches. If you're new to Agile or Scrum, what a lot of people do is like, oh, we have a feature. This feature is going to take three sprints. So let's cut a branch called feature one, and it's going to live over here by itself in isolation for three weeks, while master keeps changing. And then three weeks from now, you try to merge them together, and you get what we call a merge bomb. It just explodes because the number of changes are way, way too big. And it takes longer to merge the code than it did to write the code. So what we do at Microsoft instead is we in use feature flags, which allow developers to merge back into master every single day. So their branch and master are always in sync. So three weeks from now, when it's time to ship, their code is already sitting inside of master. There is no big merge conflict. All we have to do now is turn on the flag once it's actually in production. Using feature flags also allow you to separate deployment from releasing. If you don't use feature flags, as soon as you copy those files to that server, that feature is released. Right? Because there's no way to force people or hide it from those individuals. But when you have feature flags in place, which is essentially an if statement that says either run this code or don't from an external entity, I can actually ship the code without releasing the code, which is kind of cool. It's freeing. So I can actually ship a lot of code and then turn it on for individuals and turn it off for individuals. But that will give us the power and also allows us to mitigate really quickly, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. At the end of our sprint, what we need to do is we send out what we call a sprint mail. I'm going to show you the new way and the old way. What's interesting is, is that we've actually changed the way that we even do this internally at Microsoft, which is really neat. All 50 feature teams used to send me an email at the beginning of the sprint saying, this is what we intend to do for the next three weeks. At the end, I'd get another 50 emails that said, this is what we were able to do. And inside of it would be a video that you could watch that would show you that code working as if I had stayed and actually viewed your sprint review, which is really nice. So now you have 50 teams all able to collaborate and stay in sync by simply reading emails that they would get from time to time. 50 emails is a lot of emails to get, and you actually get 100 emails because they start and stop on the exact same day. Right? So that's a lot of freaking emails. So you have to be really good with your Outlook rules to make sure that you don't just go crazy with it. And what it used to look like is this. This is just a work item query out of our boards feature. I could click on these links and see all the details of that particular work item. And then all of a sudden, I would get another video and an email with a video in it. This video is really cool. We did it because I simply could not sit in 50 sprint reviews because of the time zone issues, nor would I probably want to sit in 50 sprint reviews. It's just too much. So what we did is we said, just put a video in there of what I would have seen had I been in your sprint review. This actually had a really cool side effect that we did not expect. You cannot use Photoshop or After Effects or any trickery in that video. The software has to work which means the developers, for me to be able to put that out the last day, have to be done before the last day of the sprint. Because if you're new to Scrum, that last day can be a pretty frantic day. The code churn is enormous as you try to get all that work done that you've been getting half done. But now, to get in the video, it has to be done. 
so that we can actually record it in the video. This also gives your program manager an opportunity to review the code before they give it out to the public to make sure that it looks like they expected it to look, and you still have a couple days to go ahead and polish it and maybe re-record a portion of the video. But the video actually has to be real, and it had became this forcing factor for our teams to actually get things done, which is really powerful as well. So always been a good benefit. So this ended up being way too much overhead. So recently, we went to this instead. Instead of the, each individual team sending us an email, we actually took it up a level to their lead. So for example, work item tracking has five teams underneath. So we took those five emails, and you get this one email instead. Aaron Bjork actually runs all the work item tracking. We are now tracking the actual epics, not the actual work underneath the epic individually. So now I get a far fewer number of emails. I get a much more concise and easy way to analyze what that entire work item tracking team is working on, and then I still have the video at the end that shows all the value that was added. But this is just an example of how we're still trying to figure out ways that we can be more efficient. We don't just assume that we got it right and keep doing that. Every time we can see a way that we can be more efficient, we do so, and changing the way that we actually send out our epics emails has been a great way to kind of speed us up a little bit. How do we do planning? We used to plan, this is another one that we recently changed. We used to plan 18 months in advance. But we realized that we were never, ever getting to the stuff that we thought we wanted 18 months from now. So what we did is we started only doing 12 months in advance. Now, this is planning and strategy. And we do not hold ourselves to this 12 months. So if I were to say it's January 1st, where do I want to be January 1st a year from now? If I've only done 60% of that a year from now, that's still a success. Because the world changes. Our competition changes. The landscape that we're working in changes. So what I need a year from now might not be the same five weeks from now. Two months from now, it could be drastically different, what I think I need. So we're constantly reevaluating what that 12-month strategy is, comparing it to what the industry is saying today, so that we're not stuck in the mud and saying, nope, that's what we said we're going to do, and we're going to do it. No, we're going to evaluate it and make sure that what we think we need to do is still accurate and still relevant in the landscape that we're working in today. We do break it down into two six-month semesters. Those semesters land at big conferences. Historically, it was Microsoft Build which is a very popular Microsoft conference. And the other one was Microsoft Connect. They were about six months apart. And the teams are like, what do we want to announce? What big things do we want Scott Guthrie to get on stage and say, this is what we're announcing today? And we would kind of guide towards that to get what are our big, giant items that we want. And then we basically do three-week sprints. And then every four sprints, we come together and say, how are all the rest of the teams doing? Again, I got to sit in on Aaron Bjork's team doing one of these quarter meetings. It was kind of neat. So he gets all of his leads together, and the leads sit in a room and have pizza, and they talk about what they did for the last and what they're going to do for the next quarter. And what was interesting is I heard one of the teams say, well, one of my engineers is going to go off and produce this widget. This widget's going to allow our customers to do X, Y, and Z. It's really going to have a cool experience for blah. And another engineer said, interesting. I have an engineer that wrote something that sounds just like that, because we needed it to do blah, 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 and I think it's going to fit your needs as well. Why don't you have your engineer talk to my engineer and make sure that we don't need two controls? Had that meeting not happened, we'd have two controls that were almost exactly the same, with probably slight different usability issues that caused the, the user to be confused and why there's two that look like they should be the same but aren't exactly the same. You can't have code reuse if you don't have the teams actually come together and talk about what their future plans are and what they've already done so that you can actually reuse that code. Right? So that's an amazing meeting for that reason alone, let alone making sure that everybody on the same team is driving in the same direction. Right? So it has a lot of cool benefits there. So highly encourage you to make sure that people take that time to sync up with other people that they're related to as well. Remember I said aligned autonomy? They have a complete autonomy here as a team to make sure that they deliver on their sprint goals and make sure that their quarters are right. And then we have our leadership basically aligning everyone on what our strategy and our semesters are going to look like. Let's talk about quality real quick. Historically, we were like everyone else. We had a code freeze. Code freeze is a polite way of saying, please stop typing. Because if you keep typing, you'll keep writing bugs. And we need to count the bugs you already have. So please, go have a pizza party. Go do something else. Just go get distracted. But do not keep writing code. We throw all this code over to the QA team, and the QA team works as hard as they can, and then you get all that technical debt back. That's how we worked as well. The problem with working like this is that there's no consistency in how much technical debt or how many bugs that you've gotten. It's really hard to plan when you're going to be able to release when your charts look like this. You might have thought, hey, we're doing pretty good. These two weren't too bad. Then all of a sudden, you have this huge peak and valley here. Like, what the heck just happened? Maybe you tried a new technology for the first time. The reason that you don't know what happened is because the developers aren't testing anything. 
They're not writing unit tests. They're not writing manual tests. They're not even thinking about testing. They're getting code complete. And they're throwing this untested code over the wall, and the QA team comes back with this huge mountain of technical debt. Again, Bug Hodges springs in, says, this is enough. This is ridiculous. I always want to be one week away from shipping, always. And he did some math and said, well, historically, our engineers can clear one bug a day per week, or one bug a day. So if I do five bugs per engineer, I should be able to get shipping in a week, right? If I know all my engineers can clear one bug a day, and none of my engineers carry more than five bugs at a time, I can say on Monday I want to ship on Friday. Everyone stops what they're doing and only fixes bugs. We should be bug free by Friday. Right? And ready to ship. That was his logic. So we created something called a bug bar. What we wanted to do is go from this to something more like this. To know how many bugs I have, I have to be testing it earlier. So I had to start doing integration testing earlier. I had to start doing unit testing earlier. I had to have better automation tests when we were still doing automation tests. We had to test more frequently, earlier, and better than we were before. And we tracked this very closely. Remember I said measure everything? We have something called a bug bar. And what we do is we measure, on average, how many bugs our teams are actually carrying throughout the previous sprint. This is an opportunity for us to inspect and adapt our process. Now, I cannot stress this enough. You cannot punish your team for these numbers. I'm going to say that again. You cannot punish your team for these numbers. Sometimes I show people this, and you can see their eyes light up, and they start wiggling their fingers like this, like they're going to go crush all their developers and make them sad. I'm like, then you're never going to get the numbers you want. Because engineers are smart people. If I get in trouble because that number is 6.5, that number will never be 6.5 again, <laughs> even if it's supposed to be, right? Because I'm an engineer, and I'll make this number exactly what you want this number to be. But this is a number where we can actually learn from. The fact that it's higher is an opportunity for me to inspect how my team is working and adapt their process so that they can stay below that. This is not a punishment number. As a manager at Microsoft, and I am a manager at Microsoft, if my team is failing to meet a bug bar, it's a failure on me. Because I didn't provide them what they needed to be successful. And what I need to do now is go and figure out what is it that you needed. Did you need more time? Did you need more training? Do we need more capacity? What do we need so that you can stay below this number? Because this is extremely important for us so that we can ship when we're supposed to ship. But if you punish them with this, these numbers will be useless. They're going to be suspiciously low, like this 0.73. I don't even know if anyone was coding that sprint. right? That's a really good number. That's a suspiciously low number, in my opinion, that I'd have to go and have a conversation with, too, as well. But maybe they are that good. Another thing that we do is we do an engineering scorecard. Azure DevOps runs 24 by 7. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, there's never an opportunity for it to be down. It can't even be taken down to be upgraded. Right? When we upgrade it, it's upgrading it while you're using it. And the only thing that you should ever notice is something that took three milliseconds the first time might take 0.6 seconds this time. And that's if you catch it right while we're updating it. Right? That's the only experience. You should get no errors, no retries, nothing. It should still work. We had to do a lot of architecture to allow an application, while it's being used, be upgraded without ever dropping any of the packets, without making sure that our users were negatively impacted. No matter how hard we try, we still have live site incidents. That's what an LSI stands for. LSI means that the code is not performing the way it's supposed to be performing, and we now have a live site incident. We measure all of this stuff. But what's really interesting about the engineering scorecard, remember, we don't have devs and QA and ops anymore. We have engineers now. Everyone owns this number. I remember, again, back when I worked at Compaq, I would write all these cool bugs, and the product would be out in production. I'd sleep through the night like a baby. But someone was fighting those bugs. right? They were getting service calls. And some poor person was on the phone trying to figure out why this stuff didn't work the way it was. It wasn't me. Right? So I kept doing what I'd always done, because it was easy. But what happens when you wake the engineer up who broke the code to make them fix the code? Code gets good real fast. And that's exactly what we do at Microsoft. We actually have people that are on rotation that are the engineers that wrote the software that every time we have one of these gets on that bridge and starts troubleshooting why our system isn't working anymore. The people who are making the bad decisions now pay the consequences for those bad decisions. And it has changed drastically the way that we do our job. It's imperative that you have, what's the mantra that we use? If you wrote it, you run it. Right? No longer do you throw this over the wall to someone else to deal with. You are now responsible for it. Luckily, you rotates. It's not the same person all the time, because that would be a miserable, miserable job. But what we do is we have DRIs. It's a, uh, what does that stand for? Designated Responsible Individual that is on call. And they're on call for about a week. 
and then it takes about two and a half months, three months before it comes back around to them. So it's not just this death march, all I do is stay on call, because it affects your personal life. You can't go to your son's soccer game if you're on call, because you have to be able to get to the machine and start troubleshooting this within five minutes of us detecting that we have a life site incident. Then you have to mitigate that problem, and that's what these numbers are doing here, is telling us how long it took us to detect, how long it took us to mitigate, and then after we figure out how to mitigate it, we have to go do a root cause analysis. We then have to go ahead and put in our product backlog the long-term fix that makes sure this never happens to us again. Right? So this is the process that we go through every single time. And we are completely transparent. You can go out right now and search and look for Azure DevOps LSI, and you will get hits of all the reports that we've written and given to the public saying, this is what happened, and this is how we're going to promise it never happens to you again. One of our data centers in San, San Antonio got struck by lightning, took out all the air conditioners, brought down the entire freaking data center. You know what's so embarrassing about it? We have this website that tells you if we're having a live site incident or not. Was in that data center, in only that data center, so we couldn't even tell you that we got struck by lightning. How embarrassing is that? That's now replicated across multiple regions, as you can imagine. We learn from that so that if one gets taken down, we can still tell you that why it got taken down instantly, which we couldn't tell you before. But we learn from all this stuff. Again, you turn the red ones yellow and the yellow ones green, but you do not punish your team for these numbers. So this is really quickly what we went from. We went from having milestones every four to six months to shipping every three weeks. We went from thinking of our code as horizontal and thinking of it as vertical. And that's a people problem. That is not a technology problem. If you, how many DBAs do we have? Any DBAs in the room? Kind of? OK, I'll pick on them then. DBAs, historically, are the hardest for me to convince that we need to cut our application vertically instead of horizontally. I remember one team told me, nope, Donovan, I need to go off and figure out every join, every stored procedure, every clustered index, non-clustered index. I need to know everything about the scheme of this database before we write a single line of code. I said, that's ridiculous. It's going to take you months to do that, and it's not going to be right. I said, nope, this is what we have to do. I'm like, fine, I'm going to give you three months to go do this entire database schema for us for the entire solution as if you know it, but you've got to make me one promise. I said, what's that? You can never change it. I said, Donovan, that's ridiculous. We're going to have to change it. Like, if you're going to change it anyway, then why am I going to give you three months to go off and do it? Right? What I want to do is I want to show value to our customers instantly. I want to show them that they can log into a website and go to their home page. How many ta tables in a database do I need for that? One. How many columns do I need? Two. A username and a password. You mean to tell me you're going to spend three months designing the entire database instead of giving me one table with two columns in it? Go do that for me right now. Let's go show our customers some progress. In the next sprint, we're going to go change it again. And the technology has finally reached to where our databases can now be as fluid as the code and the applications that we write. Matter of fact, I'm going to be speaking in a webinar with Redgate tomorrow on the state of database DevOps about that exact thing, right? Because we have the technology now to where we can treat every part of your application, the database, the schema, even the infrastructure, as code and move it as fluidly as we do everything else in your pipeline. So do not cut your applications horizontally. You've got to start cutting your teams vertically instead. Again, team rooms are in there, which is extremely important. We make sure that our teams went from these ginormous 20-person teams down to 8 to 12-person teams. Right? That allowed our daily stand-ups to be more efficient, that allowed our teams to be more efficient, and allowed us to move very, very quickly as an organization. So this is just a bullet list of all the kind of things that we've learned so far and are we're going to continue to keep learning on to make sure that we move as fast as we can. These are things that you can try, but again, do not take this as we need to go do all the things that the Azure DevOps team did, but just learn that we are constantly trying to improve, and you should be doing the same thing as well. So quickly, what I want to do before I leave here in the next minute or so is talk about people who are going to help you do that. This is my team. Uh, we got nicknamed the League of Extraordinary Cloud DevOps Advocates. Most people just call us the League. Uh, and the quickest way to get a hold of us is that hashtag. So if you're not on Twitter, but you have a question, open up a Twitter account, use that hashtag in a question, and that entire team will come running to that question for you. We will all either read it, and we'll go back in and try to find an answer for you. One of the best developers you're ever going to meet in your life lives here in Seattle. This is my DevOps conscience. He lives in. Um, in Australia. This guy comes from Chef and PowerShell. He's my ops guy for Windows. And she is my Kubernetes, Linux, open source guru uh, who lives in California. And if you tweet at us, we will come running. It's sort of like a, like a bat signal almost, right? If you actually use that, that hashtag there, we'll literally just see it and then come running, which is really, really awesome. And then another thing that I want to talk about really quick, yeah, that actually should have loaded much quicker than it did, but it didn't on here. Oh, she's awesome. She does all this crazy CrossFit stuff. When I met her, she was doing uh, handstand push-ups. Yeah, I would. Uh, my, 
she's on, yeah. She, she, and if you see her on stage, she's one of the best presenters you're ever going to see on stage, which is really cool, too. So if you ever get a chance to see her speak, she's in Hong Kong right now on tour, uh, speaking in a tour there, but she's fantastic. So is, actually, all of them are, are really good speakers, but she's in a league on her own for sure. Fantastic person. So what I'm going to do now, because we are actually at time, and I think we're almost exactly at an hour, I am going to spend the next 30 minutes at that Q&A. So you can come over here and ask me whatever questions that you want about Agile, Microsoft inside of DevOps, and all that kind of stuff. So the last thing I want to do is say thank you so much for having me, and I hope you have a great event. Thank you. Thank you.